Okay, what about valvular disease? So just to go through this quickly, because we're gonna have a whole video on valvular disease, but I just want you to see what these look like on the uh, pressure volume loops. So aortic regurgitation, you just have to kind of visualize what's happening here. Remember, we're viewing things from the left ventricle. If I have aortic regurgitation, I have more blood flowing retrograde into the left ventricle. I eject that blood out, comes right back, right? And so that, that blood is going to increase my preload because now I'm getting blood from the aorta and I'm getting blood from the left atrium. And so this is just same song and dance. It's we're just, you know, once you understand the determinant, what's happening physiologically, you take that determinant and you just plug it in. What happens when I increase preload? End diastolic volume goes up. Simple as that. Now you'll notice though, check this out. There's going to be these kind of curves over here. See, there's not straight lines anymore. That's because we have blood regurgitation. That valve's not completely shut. So we don't really have isovolumetric contraction relaxation. Instead, we've got some uh, changes going on in the pressure because we have a leaky valve. So this is a giveaway. If you see these in a, if you see these kind of curves, like you see here with aortic and mitral regurgitation, uh, where you would expect to see vertical lines. Aortic stenosis. So again, stenosis distal to the left ventricle. We already said, what does that do? Increases afterload. So we already went through this, right? So increases afterload, increased end systolic volume, increased peak height, mitral regurgitation. Um, again, retrograde flow, but be careful. It's retrograde flow into the left atrium, not back into the aorta. Now you might be saying, oh, I got you, Dr. R, you made a mistake. You put increased preload, it's supposed to be decreased preload because the blood is flowing back into the left atrium. Not quite. It actually is increased preload. So why is it increased preload? Because that blood that's flowing into the left atrium, you're losing that blood from the left ventricle. That's true. But the left atrium now is getting the blood that was supposed to be ejected from the left ventricle, and it's getting the blood from the pulmonary veins. It's getting two sources of blood. So the left atrium starts to dilate. What happens when the left atrium dilates? On a side tangent, remember, it's the most posterior chamber of the heart, cardiovascular dysphagia, it can cause um, esophageal dysphagia, it can cause uh, damage to the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, remember those two things. But also, as that blood builds up, right, that blood is going, when that mitral valve opens and diastole, you're gonna get even more blood flowing into the left ventricle. So at the end of the day, the left ventricle is still gonna see that preload. It's still gonna see that blood. It didn't get rid of that blood. That blood's just gonna come back and there's gonna be more and more and more of it. So actually the preload is increased in mitral regurgitation. That's why you can see here, the end diastolic volume is elevated. And the other giveaway here, again, like I said, you lose, you have loss of isovolumetric phases. Okay, so mitral stenosis. Notice mitral stenosis, big difference from aortic stenosis. It's not affecting the afterload because it's proximal to the left ventricle. So because it's proximal, we're getting less blood in. We don't have a problem getting blood out, we have a problem getting blood in. If we can't get blood in, lower uh, total volume in the left ventricle, decreases preload. What does that do? End diastolic volume comes down. Again, taking the determinant and just plugging it in.